My name is Richard and I work at Empire for these fine folk down here. And uh, there's a GitHub link at the bottom, my notes will be there. So if I go too fast, you don't hear anything, or if you want to look at it for reference afterwards, it's all there. Um, I'm talking about debugging and Ruby and Rails, because I speak from a lot of experience. I create a lot of bugs, but in fairness, it's for free. I don't charge the company for those. So, in looking at tools, can we have a show of hands? How many of you actively look for tools? Who reads forums and looks? Oh, cool, so fair amount. Maybe like a third. For the rest of you, you're getting it for free today. It's coming to you. So hopefully, it's as useful to you as I find it to me. So looking at tools in a general sense, I think we can identify three areas. Some help write better code, so linters, whether you have a Ruby lint or a JavaScript linter, that can be helpful. Some help writing tests more easily. So guard and spork is a really nice combination that I use. And some help finding bugs uh, a lot easier and understanding errors. Uh, better errors is the gem is a really useful one for that. Nothing really new there. So when I started developing, I thought development would be like this. You have a beautiful road and you can skip along merrily and you write code, deploy it, change people's lives, make the world a better place. But too often, this is what happens. The road is hard. There are bugs, you make mistakes, and you can't find that freaking irritating little issue that just won't resolve itself. And sometimes it's not code that you've written. Sometimes you're looking at a bug that's come up and it's your job to fix it. So regardless of the circumstances, you have to be in the business of problem solving. And I thought earlier from uh, Matthew's talk on us being artists, there's a, I suppose I see another way. You can see us as hackers, developers, programmers, artists. I think of us as problem solvers, which is generic, admittedly. But a lot of what we do every day is just starting with one problem at a time and solving it. And sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's not. Um, and when I started developing the open source uh, frameworks, one of the things I subscribed to was a good, neighbors, uh, good fences make good neighbors policy. So the frameworks code sits over there, and I don't understand it. It's written by very smart people and edited by community, and all these gems that you might bring in are written by smart people, and I don't get that. But I know my code, so I'm going to look at my code really hard and try and fix it where possible. And provided the other stuff just magically works, it's fine. And as I've matured as a developer, you start to see that it's not really the case. That code is written by smart people, often smarter people. So if it's written by smarter people, it's written even better than your code is written. So it's written succinctly. There's less verbose stuff to read. It's actually a lot easier to understand than just reading any other ordinary developer's code. So exploring that code is a really helpful thing to do. And one of the tools we're going to be going through today, Pry, makes exploring it a lot easier. That you should have access to it. And one of the nice things of Pry is being able to put a, a breakpoint into the code, so it'll stop execution and show you exactly what's happening. You can do that in any of the core Rails gems. So if you have an active support issue or active record is complaining about this or that, put a breakpoint in there and see exactly what it's doing. That code is not above you. It's entirely yours to be playing with. And that's a nice way to start solving problems, not just with your stuff, but look at the other stuff, see what other gems are doing. And if you're doing something wrong, or if other gems are doing something wrong, the code out there does sometimes have bugs. So, if I can show you a tool to do this, you'll often find reasons for people not doing them. One of the things is that tools take time, time to learn. And if you've heard about this cool tool, let's say I tell you about Pry, and you're on a project and you're already five days behind, Goodness gracious, you are not going to spend time now trying to get a tool to work. Well, that does not sound like fun. And you're just going to be late of having to learn. There's inertia. Uh, it's not that people hate learning. Sometimes you passionately hate it. Sometimes you enjoy learning, but you just don't feel like it. You're comfortable where you are. And sometimes you're unconvinced that what you're going to use is actually useful. Well, as for the first, the time it takes to finish this talk should be enough to learn the basics of Pry. So if you don't know it, then you should be comfortable. Uh, inertia, you've been learning stuff already. So if you haven't learned anything that's Ruby Fuser, then you've lost out. 
And usefulness, if I can't convince you then, well, you can slap me afterwards. Okay, so we're going to be looking at Pry. And before we do, I want to find out how many people have used Pry out there. Nice. How many people have used Jazz Hands? Okay, not as many. Cool. So I've got something for everyone, <laughs> except Gary, who's used both. Okay, a little bit of background. Pry was created by these guys, written for Ruby, powerful alternative to RB shell, and runtime developer console. Now, Pry and its plugins aren't a tool. The wrong way to see it is that it's, it's a tool that can do one thing. It's actually more like a toolbox. It has a whole bunch of tools, and it can help in many different ways. And what I'm doing today is just showing you a little bit of that. There's so much more. If you, the more you put in, the more you'll get out. Literally, what I'm doing today scratches the surface of what you can do, but it's powerful enough to help you even so. So, installing Pi. Um, you can either just do gem install Pi and run Pi pretty much anywhere. Or you can add it to your Rails project by that second line, gem Pi group development. You don't want this going on production. Uh, what Pi can afford is those breakpoints, and if that gets to production, that would not be good. A person with a page and <laughs> your entire app would stop. Um, if you just install Pry, and we're going to get into Jazz Hands and what it offers afterwards, but if you just install Pry, it does not replace your console. So your console is going to be the standard IRB. Can we show of hands who enjoys using IRB? Okay, a few. Cool. I hate it passionately. <laughs> but if you want to replace it, you can run a little bit of code at the bottom, which will replace IRB with that. And then as soon as you run Rail C, it'll go straight to the Pry console. So it looks just the same, but it's got all the extra stuff tacked on, which makes it really sweet. Uh, one of the things I subscribe to is tools that make your life easier. If you spend most of your time fighting with your tools, trying to get them to work just the way you want, then that's not really a tool worth having, because it's actually making life more difficult. But Pry slots in there. Once you've installed it, it replaces your console, and you can enjoy it or not. So as to why you'd want to use Pry, um, you have this ls command which will list things. It lists anything. Uh, it lists this big block of stuff over here. These, it'll list uh, attributes, methods, global variables, instance variables, class variables, anything that you want to see. So there's a lot of stuff there. So I wouldn't recommend you just do ls straight away. You can apply these switches to start limiting it down. So you can apply uh, capital G just to grip and pull just a subset. Uh, you can pull minus C just to get constants. Uh, my favorite at the bottom is these two over here. If you use these two and you're working with a new class, you can just do that and it'll spit out the names of all the methods that you can actually access on it. Because if you're in a standard Rails console and you type class dot tab tab, do you want to see all 6,033 results? Goodness gracious, no, I don't want to see 6,033 results. But with something like that, you can see all the methods on that object, and that's a lot more sensible, I find. Um, that ls command, you can use it on anything. You can use it on the class, you can use it on an instance, you can use it on a method. I'll show you a bit more now when we start playing around with some of the, uh, the features. It's very powerful. It's just really, what does this object or method or instance have? Scoping is a really nice ability of prior to change what self is. So when you start off by default, uh, you're in just a Rails console. Then you can CD. It's kind of like, almost like the Linux command, uh, change directory, but you're almost changing scope, change context into this class. So if I do CD class, then now self is the class. And you can just do new to create an instance of the class. Okay, let's take a look. So there, I've just started a console. And I have a simple alarm clock app inspired by my alarm clock plus Android app. Um, if in the console, if you do self, you get main. You can see the alarm, and you'll see there self is actually the class. So you get a description of all of the fields. You can then cd into new, in which case your context is an instance of the class. So you can start doing things like description equals whatever. You don't need to do class.description or reference a particular variable, you are already in the context of that instance. So it makes it really easy to play around with. You could even cd into a method. So that to JSON method, which is available, just cd into that. 
and you'll see that examining self actually returns the output. So, in changing scope, uh, there are three shortcuts you can use. You can either CD into something to drill down, or CD dot dot to go back up, or CD slash to go to the root level, or CD minus to switch between root and the level you were at. So here, let's take a look. You get alarm.new. You can then CD into that alarm and create a new one from itself, and CD into that. And over here, we can just save, and of course, I don't need to do self.save, I don't need to do alarm2.save, because I am alarm2 at that point. So just calling save, it knows what to do with it. But then if you want, while you're busy here, you can just do cd slash and go straight back to the root, play around with something else, and then if you want to go back, cd minus again. So you get a really nice quick navigation between what you're busy with and just going back to the root without having to load up a new console to play around a bit more. By far one of the most useful methods is you see something, let's say, called 2S. Find 2S for me. So if I do find 2S, you'll notice here you have 2S and 2 sentence, because of course 2S is a, a partial of that. So with the ability to search the entire base, and this is not just your methods, these are all the methods exposed, you can find out what 2S does. Finding show method. Show method 2S will literally just spit out uh, the code for that function. So when you don't know what something is doing, then you can do that. Remember I said earlier that you want to explore the Rails gem code. You don't want to hold it as a black box. Anything that happens on the Rails side after my code ends is scary, and I don't want to look at it. Fully take a look what it's doing. It might explain why you're having the bug that you are. So if you do show method, whatever, then it'll show. And if you see this list over here, just throw that part in, you know, the full namespace and method, and you get it. And nothing's off limits. It'll just show you whatever you want to see. Interestingly, you can also run shell commands. So anything that starts with a dot goes straight through to the bash shell. So you can do dot cat file name, and it'll show it, or dot ls, which of course is not the same as the prior ls. That'll be an actual ls. Uh, dot cd app to move into one of the folders. And that last command, I didn't have the guts to try at home. It should work, <laughs> but I wouldn't do it. So if anyone determines whether it's safe to do, you can let me know, and I'll let everybody else know. But I'm not running it. Okay. Now that's part of the cool thing. If you can run the console, it's nice to play around with code. Go in, do things, manipulate things. But the really time-saving feature is here. You have code that runs, and you want it to stop there, but they don't really know what it's doing right at that particular spot. And this works for tests as well. If you're doing tests that are breaking, you can put this into the code, any line of code, any of the Rails code, any gem, plonk this in there, and it, that binding .pry command. And as soon as the code hits that command, you're going to get that. It's going to break out and show you binding is where I am. And that's the code. And you can start going through line by line. You can then query what the variables are. So I've got an obviously naive thing. I don't even know if this function actually works. But you can start questioning all these things. You can question this variable. You can change a variable, question that variable. Start seeing little bit by little bit why it's doing the things it is. And if it then produces an error at a spot, you can introspect a little bit more. So these are some commands that you use. Uh, where am I? We'll show you that block again. Uh, there's next, there's step, which will step into the next level down. And there's finish, which will finish as far as that frame goes. And continue just to get out of there. I would recommend not putting this binding.pry command in the middle of a loop that repeats 50,000 times. Because once you hit continue, it'll then run until it hits it again, which is in you know, the next loop, and again, and again, and again, and again. So, uh, binding.pry allows you a really nice way to get into the code anywhere, which is very useful. But you may be using pow, and you're thinking, well, this doesn't really help me. If I'm using power, then I don't have that output, which just allows me to see when it's broken. So what you use is that, remote pry. And if you do this, then you'll get access to the very same thing. Um, it'll allow you to connect to that remote instance, and you can ad take advantage of the fact that you can break into code anywhere. It doesn't have to be demonized or not, which is useful. Okay. 
Now, I said that prior is useful, and it is. It includes a few things, but it doesn't include as much as it could. The plugins provide a lot of extra functionality. Um, there's the link, and this is what comes with Jazz Hands. Jazz Hands includes Pry Debugger, uh, the Stack Explorer, Remote, and I think most importantly, Awesome Print, which I'm going to show you a bit of now. If you're playing around a console or you've broken into the code, you can see there what the standard RB looks like. It's all white. Uh, Pry looks a little bit nicer, and with Awesome Print, it looks really nice. You get it really nicely laid out. You can see what the class looks like. If you're dealing with a specific instance, instead of having those two rather unhelpful methods at the top, you have a very clear one at the bottom. You can see all your properties nicely laid out. So it makes exploring your code faster and quicker. When you're looking for a specific method, you don't need to read through three lines of description after description, field after field with their values. You can see them nicely laid out. And the order's preserved, so you can you know, look at the same place every time. It's really sweet. It colorizes as you type, which is, I think, nice. Uh, primarily because you can see spelling mistakes. If you start typing repeat and it doesn't colorize, then you know that you probably have missed the A or something. So it's one feedback clue to you that you, know, you haven't typed the keyword in properly. Um, it's little indications if you know, the class hasn't gone blue. It's not a valid or a recognized class. One of the things that uh, the Prize Stack Explorer gives you is the ability to break in at that code and type show stack at any point. So have any of you used, uh, well, I suppose whatever tool you use, we use Honey Badger. But we have an error of 500. It gives you a nice stack trace of this call, that call, that call, that call, that call, that until you've got the error that we have. Now, you can call that anywhere. You don't have to wait for a 500 before you can query your code. If you break into your code anywhere with that product debugging, then you can see the stack there just by typing show stack. So if you're not quite sure what you're seeing, if there's middleware that may be gotten in the way, just type that. It's really simple. Um, and you can start following the flow of things from the very first point of the request coming in to where you are now. Um, yeah, that is Pry. I can show you a demonstration. I'm not sure how much extra it is to show. I think I've run through rather fast. So, I have time for questions. Any questions on Pry, or would you like to see Pry in action? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that sounds, I don't know if you guys heard that. I, I showed the find method and the show method. You can also have edit method, and then pop in the in the place of the code, and then you can edit and just save it, and then it'll take effect. Now, obviously, if you're working, you can edit the Rails, you can edit the core thing, and it'll save it within your bundler folder, and that's fine. So, certainly for testing, you can have that. But it's really nice in just being able to edit the code quickly without having to worry about finding it and you know, traversing the full hierarchy to getting there. Well, does anyone use log console uh, puts and stuff for debugging, or do you you guys use that. Who uses console output? Lots of lugging. Okay. I find this a bit easier. That works, and it works nicely. Sometimes we don't have control over the server. But this approach will allow you to really get in there and see why it's misbehaving. So you can obviously stop the code, and you don't want to do this on a production server, which is where the puts might be a bit safer, or logging. Um, but it's very nice to get in there and see why the variable is misbehaving, because it's that, even though you expected it to be something else. And then to dig in frame by frame, you can go back into the Rails code and see why it has the value that it has. Any questions? Yeah. Which one? Okay, cool. I haven't played with it, but yeah, that sounds, that sounds cool. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, yeah. The prior apple. Uh, 
I actually don't have the, the inside knowledge to that. Uh, I've only been using it for the last nine months, but I made the port from Django and Python to Ruby. And the first thing I looked for was a comparison, uh, an equivalent to IPython. And Pry is the closest. It has a lot of functionality. Um, it even gives you something nice. You know the control R, and you can start searching for the last command in Pry. That actually works in, Python, in Pry as well. So it's nice. It's not perfect, but it definitely speeds things up a lot over standard RB. RB I find a little bit just lacking in features, whereas this just extends them. It doesn't change much. It just makes them a little bit easier to use. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah? Uh, the what on better errors? Oh, what it does? Oh, I love better errors. I think it's really nice when stuff does crash to actually be able to start exploring. So that works similar to this. So if you run your code in development mode, uh, having better errors allows you to start introspecting the code at various frames. So instead of just uh, seeing the error that you've got, this value is null, you can start going back to the calling frame and say, well, what was that value over there? And that one? OK, cool, I can start to understand. So I think the ability to tinker around with the code in the middle of your breakpoint, because that whole session is just preserved, is really useful. Anything else? Cool. Okay.